Hey, future respiratory therapists. So here we go, part three of our series talking about the benefits of PEEP and how they can affect your oxygenation. Okay, now if you missed part one and part two, you need to look for them on the end of this video. Go back and watch them because they're going to be greatly beneficial to you to understanding that not all oxygenation is equal. And so in part one, we pointed out how a PaO2 of 60 on 80% versus 40% is not the same thing. How we have a greater A to A difference. We have a worse of a PF ratio. And we showed you how we're not as effectively oxygenating our patient with a higher FiO2 and a lower PEEP versus with a higher PEEP and a lower FiO2. Now in the second series, in the second part of the series, we talked about why this works like this. We talked about Dalton's Law and we talked about Fick's Law. We talked about partial pressure. If you increase the partial pressure of oxygen in alveoli, then you should subsequently increase the partial pressure of the arterial oxygenation as well. But it doesn't always work like that because shunts present and exist. And so in that second part, we talked about how Fick's Law states that if we increase surface area and decrease permeable membrane thickness, then we will increase diffusion, which increases oxygenation. That's part one and part two. Now this part is talking about finding optimal PEEP. How do we know when we found optimal PEEP and how do we know when PEEP has become a problem? Because I've been telling you how good PEEP is, but now I'm here to tell you that PEEP can also be a problem, okay? And you need, as the respiratory therapist, to be able to recognize when we've exceeded optimal PEEP and entered into the realm of PEEP being detrimental for our patient, okay? So on the board here is pretty much a graph with some numbers on it and kind of kind of break this down for you like this. And what we're going to do is we're going to find optimal PEEP on this patient. We're going to break down each one of these and show you how it matters and what it means for you as a respiratory therapist and how to use it, okay? Now the first thing you see here is across the top, we have our PEEP settings. So we start at a PEEP of 5, we go to 8, 10, 12, and 15. Let's just say that all of these happen 10 to 12 to 15 minutes apart, okay? It doesn't really matter how, how much time between, okay? Um, it was more than five minutes and less than 30, okay? And so we have a timed PEEP trial here, okay? Now, we know that as we increase PEEP, we will get our alveoli to a state to where they are closer to their lower inflection point on their pressure volume curve, which I'm going to do another video. It's not part of this series, but I'm going to do another video talking about optimal PEEP or just PEEP settings in general related to the pressure volume curve because, or the pressure volume loop, because that loop itself can give us a lot of insight into PEEP and, and minimal PEEP and optimal PEEP and things like that. So hang tight and we'll get that to you. But we know that as we get to a more effective PEEP level, that we should start seeing a smaller difference between PEEP and plateau, which should equate to an improving static compliance. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so an improving static compliance. So when we look at static compliance for this patient, what we see is, is we have 21, 28, 38, 34, and 30. Now, if you were taking a board exam or the TMC and they were to ask you to choose optimal PEEP based off of static compliance, then you're going to choose the static compliance that is the best. If that's all the information you're using, then you're going with the best static compliance. So in this case, 38 is the best static compliance and this would point to a PEEP of 10 being optimal PEEP, okay? And um, that would be true in this case in regards to static compliance. Now, as we keep adding PEEP, plateau pressure will continue to rise. The difference between PEEP and plateau, okay, will now get larger. And as that happens, we are indicating that we've gone from a state to where the difference was getting smaller, but now it's getting larger, which means we have now entered a realm of 
over inflation. We are holding the PEEP at a state that is now beyond a comfortable state for those alveoli. And so we are now over expanding during the inspiratory phase. And when we do the plateau pressure, we see that our compliances start to go down. This is the result of it increasing, or this creates an increasing intrathoracic pressure. Now, increasing, in <coughs> excuse me, increasing intrathoracic pressure results in an effect on our cardiac output. Okay, because when the intrathoracic pressure gets beyond the point of optimal then it starts to squeeze on the vessels, the great vessels, and it starts to impair venous return. This decreases the amount of blood flow that is returning back to the right atrium. If the amount of blood flow returning back to the right atrium is impaired and decreased, then obviously the amount of blood moving through the pulmonary circulatory system and back to the left side of the heart is going to be decreased, which means your cardiac output is going to be decreased. So when you're talking about cardiac output and PEEP, you need to also look for the point in which cardiac output is remaining pretty much the same, and then you see a notable drop in it. So for this, we see 3.5, 3.5, 3.6. Nothing here seems to be a problem, right? doesn't seem to be any impairment of venous return happening yet until we get to 3.2. So the difference in 10 and 12, the PEEP of 12 caused an impairment of venous return, which has directly impacted cardiac output. And then as we go to 15, we see it even greater, down to 3. Okay, so we want to make a note here. Where's our best? Optimal PEEP related to cardiac output, normal, nor here we go, everything seems to look good, and then we have a decrease, right? So again, 10 is our optimal PEEP for this patient related to cardiac output. Now, cardiac output and blood pressure are directly related. If your cardiac output goes down, then your blood pressure will most likely also go down. So for those of us who don't have hemodynamic monitoring happening, when I say cardiac output, you may think to yourself, well, how do I know if cardiac output has gone down? Well, the answer to that question is, watch your blood pressure. Because when your blood pressure is stable, 130 over 90, 124 over 90, 120 over 90, maybe a small difference in systolic, systolic pressure, but essentially the same blood pressure, but uh-oh, from 10 to 12, we go from 120 over 90 to 106 over 74. We obviously have a problem happening here, right? So our optimal PEEP happens to be here. The drop in this blood pressure is telling you that when you went from 10 to 12, the heart did not like that. You've now impaired venous return and you've impaired the cardiac output, which is going to manifest through a drop in blood pressure. Okay, and that's where it happens. And if we go to 15, we see it drop even more to 100 over 70. Um, and, and that's a significant difference than where we started. Okay, now let's just take a breath here. Okay, we've talked about static compliance in relationship with plateau pressure. Okay, so don't have plateau pressure written up here. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm still get, trying to get over this cough. Um, static compliance is related to plateau pressure, specifically the difference between plateau pressure and PEEP. As it goes up and then starts to decrease, that is your point of optimal PEEP. When it starts to decrease, you will see an effect on venous return. Venous return will directly impact your cardiac output. Cardiac output will directly impact impact your blood pressure. Cardiac output and blood pressure will directly impact your oxygen consumption at the tissues. So what does that mean? That means that when arterial blood goes out with oxygen, it should come back with a certain amount of oxygen. And there's an indication of oxygen consumption between PaO2 
NPVO2. Okay, now when we talk about PVO2, we're talking about a, a, a partial pressure of oxygen in the mixed venous blood. Now to get this, you truly have to take this sample from essentially the um, right atrium to where you get the mixing of superior vena cava and the mixing of inferior vena cava blood and you get a true mixed venous oxygenation um, partial pressure reading, okay? The normal here is around 40, okay? But my point is this, the lower your PVO2 is, especially in conjunction with a loss in cardiac output and a loss in blood pressure, then what it tells the tissues is, is when they sense that loss in pressure, they say, grab more oxygen, grab more oxygen. Like, well, you better get it while you can, right? And so that leads to a greater level of oxygen consumption. This happens when venous return impairment happens. So if you look at this, look what we got here. PVO2 is 26, 28, 34. Now, why is it, why is it rising here? Well, it's rising here because we're probably getting improved arterial oxygenation going out. Okay? But then it starts to decrease. So 30, 27. Why is it decreasing? This is the key here. The key here is why is it decreasing after it goes up? Because we've obviously are improving oxygenation <coughs> up to this point. But then it goes down. And then it goes down further. And the reason being is because our blood pressure has gone down, because our cardiac output has gone down, so our oxygen consumption has gone up. Okay, like I was kind of saying, the oxygen are kind of in a state where like you better get it while you can because it's not going to be here for much longer, right? So, in terms of PVO2, you're looking for the most normal PVO2. You're looking for the point to where it's going up right before it starts to decrease. The decrease in PVO2 is the evidence of loss of blood pressure, loss of cardiac output, increase oxygen consumption. And here we see that 34 is that spot. The break was between 34 and 30. And so PVO2 is um, also an indicator of optimal PEEP that you can use to study and to find your best PEEP for your patient. Now, the last thing I'm gonna talk about, probably one of my favorite topics, is entitled CO2. And if you've seen that series, then you know I'm, um, I'm highly passionate about the, the topic of entitled CO2 and using it effectively. Now, this last one, I'm going to show you how you can use an entitled CO2 to help you find optimal PEEP. Okay, now you still have to draw blood gases for this because what we're going to monitor is our gradient. So when you see P, arterial minus entitled CO2, you're talking about your gradient between your arterial CO2 and your entitled CO2. To get this, you just subtract PaCO2. Subtract your entitled CO2, and that's your gradient, okay? Now, this gradient should be relatively small for the most part in healthy lungs, but in diseased lungs, we know it gets bigger, okay? Now, look what happens here. At peeps of 5 and peeps of 8, we have a gradient of 11 and 10. Now, the problem here is, is that these peeps are not adequately recruiting shunted alveoli. So, atelectatic regions they're not being ventilated because they're atelectatic and these peep levels aren't recruiting them and opening them up. So we have a higher gradient because we have more dead space ventilation happening in the healthy regions of the lungs. So that, that 450 ml tidal volume that you're putting in the patient is all going to the healthy regions. Well, the more you stretch and expand, the more dead space you have because not all of that gas participates with gas exchange. So this is why this is elevated and goes down until we see six here. Now this is the smallest gradient. The larger your gradient, the larger your dead space. The smaller your gradient, the smaller your dead space. Okay? So we can see here clearly that six is our smallest gradient, which means 
wherever we are here, which is a peep of 10, results in the smallest amount of dead space ventilation. Now, watch what happens when we go up to 12. Dead space, or our gradient goes up. Now, why did our gradient go up to 13? And then when we went up further, it went up to 15. Well, the answer is this. Go back to your cardiac output. Over here at 12, we started impeding venous return, which means less blood coming back to the right side of the heart, which means less blood going out, hence the decrease in cardiac output, hence the decrease in blood pressure. Now, if you have less blood coming back to the right side of the heart, then you have less blood going through the pulmonary capillaries, which creates an instance where you have ventilation greater than perfusion, which is the definition of dead space, which is why you see your gradient increasing at the point in which we see our PEEP impeding venous return. So clearly, this is the break, and a gradient of six is our best gradient, which is yielding us the lowest amount of dead space ventilation and the best VQ ratio for our patients. So when we look at this, our static compliance broke here, our cardiac output broke here, and then we know everything else broke here. For this patient, our best optimal PEEP is a PEEP of 10. Now, use that information to go pass your board exams, okay? And then, can we start doing this stuff in the clinic, guys? What I want right now is everybody who works in a facility where who does 15, 20 minute PEEP incremental trials, who monitors cardiac output, blood pressure, static compliance, PF ratio, or um, end tidal CO2 gradient, PVO2. If you're monitoring that and you're actually performing PEEP studies right now, I want to hear about it and I want to know how you're doing it. Okay, can we get past all of this peep of 10 because that's what we do? Oh, they need more, let's go to 15? Like what is that? We're just guessing. We're better than that, guys. This is the stuff right here that makes us respiratory therapists. And we gotta start utilizing it. So people look at us and go, why are you afraid, doc? We didn't see detrimental effects associated with peep until we got to 17. So 15 is okay. Don't be scared. That's our job. Okay, guys? Trust me. Hope you learned something from this video. Look forward for my upcoming videos um, associated with more things revolving around PEEP, the pressure volume loop. Also, um, things such as uh, alveolar tidal volume and minute ventilation and alveolar minute ventilation. How does that matter? And how does that make you a respiratory therapist which sets you apart from everybody else? If you like this video, please hit the subscribe button, turn on notifications so you know when the next video comes out. And by all means, throw me a comment. I'd love to converse with you. Best wishes.